everybody, and welcome to Tiger Sidelines on MC22 alongside Gabe DeArmond and Dave Matter. I'm Bo Bayman. The Missouri Tigers roll to Tennessee, and the Volunteers get to win 35 to 12 on Saturday. And we'll start with you, Gabe. This to me is. When, when you have a new coaching staff, it's kind of like one step forward, two steps back. This was definitely, I thought, a step back on Saturday. No question, because it was a very similar game to the Alabama game. I mean, it, it lasted a little bit longer, but I thought, in effect, this game was over early to mid-third quarter. And I, you understand when that's the case against Alabama. And look, maybe Tennessee is a lot better than any of us give them credit for, but I, the hope in that game was, hey, compete. You give yourself going into the fourth quarter, have a shot. And Missouri really didn't. I know people will say, but but they were driving and and maybe they score to make it an eight point game. Yeah, maybe they do. But even at that point, there wasn't a lot of faith you were going to stop Tennessee. I mean, I, it, to me, the entire second half was played with the understanding that Missouri wasn't going to win that game. And it, it's not where you want to be at this point. Yeah, and two games in, albeit against two ranked opponents, Dave. It's a tough start for Eli Drinkwitz and his staff. I mean, you still have questions at quarterback. You wonder about the defense because you got run all over. I mean, I know it's early, but still 0-2 is 0-2, and you, you got to start seeing some signs, right? Absolutely. I think if these games were in the opposite order, maybe people would feel a little bit better. But I just thought they – it was almost like they took a step backward. In the game where they should have been more competitive or we expected them to be more competitive – they're down 14 nothing, and just at that point, it barely even touched the ball. And Tennessee has the kind of offense where they can just run the ball, get first downs, go for it on fourth down four times a game, get quarterback sneaks, kind of dominate the line of scrimmage, and never really feel threatened again. So, again, I mean, we can always point out a few silver linings. I thought Connor Bazelak came in and made a pretty strong case he needs to be the quarterback. I thought he played pretty well. Hard to blame him. I mean, he comes in, they're down 14 to nothing. Um, but again, the, the defense, I thought, just took a step backwards. They just kind of got pushed around. Well, let's start with the defense. That They could not stop the run, Dave. I mean, that there was a big play that was wiped out by penalty that maybe could have changed some things with the fumble re recovery, but Tennessee goes in and scores. But at the same time, they just did not stop the run at all. Really no penetration against the run. Um, you know, they just, they just let Tennessee dictate the game. And the coverage, it, it was okay, but Tennessee didn't really need to throw the ball that much. They got a little heat on the quarterback early. You know, Isaiah McGuire got back there a few times. I thought he had an okay game. But for the most part, no, Tennessee just got whatever it needed. And if, if it didn't get it on third down, it would just line up for fourth down and control the line of scrimmage. And, you know, they had two running backs who just uh, pretty much controlled that game, and they got, got whatever they wanted. It wasn't flashy. Um, you know, they probably could have scored more, but they didn't need to, and they just they just did what they needed to do. And, Gabe, to your point, I mean, on defense, the defense couldn't cause anything to change the game. And so in the second half, you didn't think Missouri was winning. Yeah, and you wanted to – look, you understood the offense was going to be a work in, in progress. I, I mean, the offensive struggles from the first two weeks are not a surprise. But this was supposed to be a good defense. This was a top def – ten top 15 defense last year that brought eight starters back and, and this was supposed to be a, a unit that you hoped would keep you in games and and maybe it can um you know still as we go forward but the most telling stat to me was Tennessee ran the ball 51 times in that game not a single one of them lost yardage I mean that's just telling you if you remember back to the Wyoming opener last year it was a lot about missed tackles and, and just simple mistakes they were making this was about getting shoved off the ball. And while understanding Tennessee has a good offensive line, you know, you wonder, I, I mean, I'm not sure that's fixable. That just tells me you may not have the guys up front. The old saying is maybe it's not the X's and O's, it's the Jimmy's and the Joe's. And when you got guys in the trenches who are getting pushed around, I mean, it, that's a, just a recipe for disaster. I mean, 35 points and it could have been worse. Yeah, no question. Um, you know, and again, I don't think anybody's hitting the panic alarm. I mean, I picked Missouri to lose this game by 10 points. Tennessee was favored by 12. It's not a shock. You know, everybody expected this team to end up 0-3. I think what exacerbated this a little bit on Saturday is Vanderbilt's the worst team in this league. Well, 
they pushed Texas A&M in week one. And, you know, uh, Mississippi State beats LSU. Ole Miss beats uh, Kentucky last weekend. Arkansas ends a 20-game losing streak and then beats Mississippi State. So every other first-year coach or every other kind of bottom of the the – bottom third program has something they can point to and say, man, you feel really good about this. And Missouri has a tougher schedule than all of those teams, but also Missouri was supposed to be in better shape than at least a couple of those teams. And, and they just don't have that one thing they can point to yet. And I I think, I I don't think you expect to win this weekend, but Eli Drinkwitz could really use that one positive thing to point to out of the LSU game. Yeah, no doubt about it, Dave on offense, you know, 12 points against Tennessee we realize Tennessee is ranked but at the same time I mean it's still 12 points you, you got to figure out your quarterback and as you mentioned it looks like Basilak going forward but there are lots of questions on the offense yeah absolutely I, mean, I think Larry Roundtree's been really good but when you're down 14 nothing or 21 to nothing like you are at Alabama you kind of take the ball out of the running back's hands because you feel like you got to throw it so much um, I think he's been really good. We haven't seen a whole lot of Tyler Beatty. Um, the drops on Saturday were just the biggest problem. And yet, I think six total, two of them by Jalen Knox on third down. One of them definitely would have gotten the first down. The first one, he would have, I think, needed another yard or so. Uh, you know, the drop by Dominic Jacinto, you know, he catches that ball. And if he if he can outrun the couple defenders that he had a lead on, you know, that's an 84-yard touchdown. So, you just – you, you can't recreate those plays and, and you can't get them back. So um, that's the most drops Missouri's had. I think I, I looked it up, I think in over two years. So we thought about that team last year that had some issues catching the ball. Not like they didn't have six in a game where you have no margin for error. You can't afford mistakes like that. So um, I, st- I still think there's big questions about the playmakers around the quarterback, much less the quarterback situation itself. And it- – It'll be interesting to see, Gabe, if they settle in on Basilak now. You know, he said, I'm not against playing two. Well, does Robinson get in for a series or two, or now does it Connor's show? Yeah, well, obviously, by the time people see this, we're going to have a little clarity. Uh, uh, but when we're taping it, we're still a couple hours away from talking to Eli Drinkwitz. I would anticipate he names Connor Basilak the starting quarterback. Now, the question is, do you still give Sean Robinson some time? Because I, I think we talked about last week, one of the big reasons Basilak was getting time was what if your quarterback gets COVID and has to quarantine, right? You want a guy who's not completely rusty out there. But Basilak was clearly the much better quarterback on Saturday. I mean, it, it, there's, there's no discussion to be had. And I think I said – I could understand if he wanted to go one more week and and give both of them time and all that. Because, look, this is a three-week preseason where you're probably going to be 0-3 anyway. Just figure out everything you can about your team. If Robinson was the better guy in week one, Bazelak was the better guy in week two. If you want kind of a a tiebreaker, okay. But by the time that Vandy game kicks off, I think he owes it to both those kids to have a starting quarterback. Because I think what you're going to have right now, if you don't name that starting quarterback, is two guys going out there feeling like they're playing for a job on every possession, and it's not going to do anybody any good. Then you play tight. You're trying to make plays. You're, you're making mistakes here and there. And, you know, going forward, it, it, Gabe's right. I mean, it, it's almost like, Dave, they're going to have to have a hard reset after these first three games and just say, okay, preseason's over. Now let's focus forward. Right. Not that it's going to get a whole lot easier after Vanderbilt. I and mean, you still have Georgia and Florida, who to me look just as good as anybody else in the league, including Alabama. So it's, it's, it's still going to be hard, but I do think you, at some point you got to kind of have an identity. You need an identity. And you know, the whole, upside to Sean Robinson was hey this guy can be a dual threat and help you out in the run game and that's he hasn't done that at all the offense and it's not necessarily his fault every play but they can't run those quarterback runs at all and so at least with Bazelak that's not part of his game at all even though the coach says the playbook doesn't change when he changes quarterbacks but um, he can throw the ball it's a functional passing offense suddenly when he comes into the game and they're going to need that so yeah I'll, I'll be really curious to see what the decision was this week and, uh, you know, how they go moving forward with those two guys. Well, as we mentioned, they move on to LSU now. And one of the things, as we tape this early in the week, that we're watching is a hurricane because there is some talk, Gabe, of moving this game here to Columbia rather than Baton Rouge. Yeah, I know Dave and I have both heard that. Um, And I think a decision – 
ideally would be made Wednesday. If, if they had to, I think they could push it back to Thursday. But right now, this tropical storm hurricane, I, I don't know what it's categorized as, but Friday night, Saturday morning, it's supposed to get into Baton Rouge or, or on the coast. So you're not just talking about, you know, hey, can Missouri get there? Can Missouri get out? What about media traveling to the game? Or are we having fans? Um, and, and they both have a bye week later in the season, but it, you need to kind of preserve that because you're probably, we're seeing in the NFL, you're probably going to have to reschedule some games. I mean, the chances that everything gets played on time this year uh, aren't real good because of COVID. So you'd like to maintain that spot to be able to move something back uh, because the last thing you want to do is cancel games. I mean, these, these schools are already taking huge revenue hits and every game you cancel is just a giant chunk out of the, out of the pocket of these schools. So if they do play and we expect that they will in one place or another, uh, here's the line as of this morning, 20 and a half for LSU. I mean, it's been a while since Missouri's been an underdog by nearly three touchdowns, Gabe. It's been two weeks. Well, that's true. But, uh, this is this is a game that, I mean, what what are the expectations going in? You better hope you get the LSU that played against Mississippi State. They couldn't play much defense at all, and uh, even that team still still scored thirty four points. And you know Missouri hasn't come close to that yet. So it's a it's a big uphill challenge. It doesn't doesn't matter where the game is. Um, Ed Orgeron has still recruited elite talent there. Yeah, they, they stumbled in week one. We're going to see that across the league probably this year to some degree. But um, I, I looked it up. This was the first time Missouri will be double-digit point underdogs three weeks in a row since 1995. So it's, it's been a while since they've been, you know, favored to lose by this many points week after week after week. I would imagine that Tiger fans just want to see something positive at this point because as you do look around the SEC from last week, uh, you know, you had some upsets. Arkansas comes through with a victory. You have some of the quote-unquote bottom feeders playing well except for the University of Missouri, and that's a troubling thing. Uh, as we look forward to this week, uh, you have number four Florida at Texas A&M, South Carolina's at Vandy. Tennessee's at Georgia in the marquee game. Arkansas will be at Auburn, Alabama at Ole Miss, Mississippi State at Kentucky. And when I look at that Tennessee-Georgia game, that, that one is early, but still Florida gets to watch these two kind of duke it out, and we'll see which one comes out on top. You'd expect it to be Georgia, but you never know. Yeah, I didn't see anything that tells me Tennessee's quite on that level yet. I, I thought Tennessee has, has proven through two weeks. They're the third best team in the East. But I think there's one and two, then there's a gap, then there's Tennessee, then there's another gap. And then, you know, is Kentucky above South Carolina, Missouri, and Vandy? Is that just – does it even matter at that point? But, but those four are kind of and, – and that's the tough part about judging Missouri, right? I mean – if you look at the wins by Ole Miss and by Arkansas, not as much the one by Mississippi State, but, I mean, they're not, a, they're not against league heavyweights. No, those teams have not played the schedule Missouri played out of the gate. Again, everybody expected Missouri to be 0-3, and, and everybody honestly expects Missouri to be 1-5. and Anything better than 1-5 and would be incredible for Eli Drinkwood. So I think we do have to be careful. Hey, let's, let's let them play some teams that we expect them to be competitive with before we we pass any judgment that they're not being competitive yeah absolutely and, and when you look at the east the tennessee georgia game and then the georgia florida game dave a little bit later on those are going to be the ones that whoever wins those is going to be the representative and have a chance not only at the sec but the chance to go probably to the playoff yeah absolutely i mean i just watching the georgia auburn game the other night and i, I joked about this on twitter Georgia looks like they have 12 guys on defense. I mean, they are so good on that side of the ball. And they don't have, like, a bunch of name recognizable guys that the average fan outside of Georgia knows about. You know, there's no um, there's no Vadion Clowney or Dylan Moses or Nick Bolton necessarily. But, man, they, are just, they look so good. They don't even have to be that good on offense. Uh, Florida is great offensively. Dan Mullen has that thing rolling. Defensively, though, they've given up a lot of points. 
Um, and that's, that's fine. They can live with that. But, yeah, it looks like it, that could be just a great showdown. Unless Tennessee wants to get in there and, and, and mix it up and prove they, they're ready for the, the top of the division. But I'm with Gabe. I don't, I don't think they're quite there yet. That was a good win by Georgia over Auburn last week. Okay, we'll take a break. When we come back, your tweets. We have them, and we got a handful of them. So we'll get to that when we come back on Tiger Sidelines right here on MC22. Tiger Sidelines, everybody. I'm Bo Bayman, joined by Gabe DeArmond and Dave Matter, and you're watching on MC22. We're at Tiger Sidelines on Twitter, and our first tweet comes to us that says, why must we continue to try sweeps and options if they don't work at all, Gabe? Well, look, this is the offense to some extent. I mean, I, that's going to be a part of it. Um, now, I I think there is going to come a point if it continues not to work where you have to say, all right, look, what this team is built to do is hand the ball to Larry Roundtree, hope to play defense better than we have and, and see what happens. But I, I think he's – this year, and I know fans hate to hear this, but this year isn't really about this year. I, this year's about, I don't, man, if you can pick up some wins, great, but let's establish what we want to do here, which guys can do it and all that. And, and there is a, there's a certain amount of – you can't jam a square peg in a round hole. I mean, you've got to do what your team does well, but you also have to run your system because it doesn't do any good to run an offense that, that you're just saying, well, this is all we can do right now, but when we get our guys in here in two years, we're going to completely change everything. Uh, Ray says, we had a hard time against number two and number 12. Then again, Texas A&M didn't fare too well either. What a way for a new coach to have to start, but hopefully we have our QB look good. And I still love Coach Drink. That's from Ray, Dave, and it's it's true. I mean, we've touched on it. The schedule did Missouri no favors. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I think most of the fans, the ones that I hear from, the ones Gabe hears from, I think they're going to give Missouri a free pass. Now, one and nine, zero oh and ten, even two and eight's not going to feel very good. But um, I, I just feel like the the more this team struggles, it almost seems like it's more going to be considered an indictment on Barry Odom and the past staff for what they left behind, which might be, you know, it, it might be revisionist history a little bit. Cause I, I don't know the way I felt about when they finished six and six and made a head coaching change. I didn't feel like this program was completely broken by any means. I didn't think they'd win the East the next year, but I thought, Hey, the new coach coming in probably going to inherit an okay situation. I mean, it could be a lot worse, but the sample size was so small, just two games. It's, it's so tempting to say, gosh, look, compare this to Arkansas, compare this to Old Miss or Mississippi State, and Missouri seems so far behind. But again, so much comes down just to the schedule, and, and there just hasn't a whole lot to analyze yet. Well, uh, and you also, yeah, got to remember, I mean, okay, let's say 2-8 and eight is the record this year. Well, if this is a normal year, LSU and Bama aren't happening. So right, you're 2-6, right. and you've replaced them with Central Arkansas and Eastern Michigan, which I assume you beat. So you're right. four and six with games against BYU and Louisiana, which you probably split, which five and seven, it, it's, it's not great, but it's right. not what, you know, what two and eight looks like. And it's way closer to six and six than what, I mean, to me, even if, even if they win one, you're going to get a pass. I just think that you don't want the goose egg. That's the, that's the big one. And that's the next question is what week does Eli get win number one? It, it's got to be week four. I, I mean, look, I know Vanderbilt pushed Texas A&M, but I, Texas A&M, shocking. Again, they're the most overrated program in the history of college football, so big surprise. But this is a bad, bad Vanderbilt team. I, I mean, a lot of people think it's Derek Mason's worst Vanderbilt team, and he's had some bad ones. Uh, it, that's a game you need to win. And I, I understand what happened on Saturday night. But you still should beat Arkansas. I mean, the last game of last year, you had a coaching staff that looked to me like they knew they were on their way out of town and was just throwing everybody with a uniform out on the field. The starting quarterback tore his ACL, and you still beat Arkansas. They, they haven't made that big a change in one year. Um, and if they've made that big a change because your old head coach is now their defensive coordinator, then that's an issue on both sides. So those are still two games you should win. And, and I still think Missouri manages to find – one other one somewhere. Hey, Dave, don't you think that they, 
Nobody, no Tiger fan overlooks Vanderbilt anymore, just considering what's happened in the past year. They shouldn't. I mean, you know, the games have been competitive and Vanderbilt's won some. So including just last year. So yeah, I, I agree with Gabe. I mean, LSU blew out Vanderbilt over the weekend. They have the worst offense, one of the very worst offenses in the entire country. If you just look at like yards per play, they cannot move the ball at all. So my guess is regardless what happens this weekend, Missouri's defense is going to look a lot better against Vanderbilt. And by then you would expect Missouri to have a, more of a clue, more of an identity on, on offense and, and they should win that game. But again, you know, we thought they'd stroll into Nashville a year ago and win that game. That's right. Ms. Mike wants to know, Mizzou's recruiting needs to improve. D-line needs to get pressure, play fundamental defense, and or new defensive coordinator. And oh, by the way, the offensive line has to be better as well. That about sums it up. I really thought we might get three weeks into the season before we started firing people. Um, (laughs) I was wrong. Look, you know, the defense was obviously bad, but maybe it was just a bad day. And even if it wasn't, Eli Drinkwitz chose to keep Ryan Walters, and he chose to continue to do this. So uh, the, the thing that has bothered me this week is, well, I don't blame him for the defense. That's all Ryan Walters' fault. But I, 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 but I give all the, all the bad stuff, I give Drinkwitz a pass, but Walters has to go. Uh, you can't do that, man. He's the head coach. The buck stops. He kept Ryan. And I'm not saying fire Eli Drinkwitz either. I'm just, uh, I, I guess I should learn at some point to stop trying to apply logic to conversations about this stuff. Absolutely. Uh, please compare contrast MU's quarterback strength and weaknesses versus LSU defensive performance in 2020. And then he asked about the impending weather. We talked about that. Um, uh, compare contrast MU quarterback versus the strength and weakness of the LSU defense. LSU defense is pretty good. Yeah, and they got Derek Stingley, their stud uh, cornerback, back last week. He didn't play against Mississippi State not to say that he would have been the difference in that game but he certainly was a difference maker he might be the best defensive player in the SEC probably the best cornerback in the country Um, and you know whoever he's against on Saturday wherever that game is played is going to have a tough time getting open but you know if they go with Connor Bazelak and again we'll know more about that later today and definitely when people watch this I I thought he looked pretty poised I mean the, the guy doesn't get rattled that's for sure that one snap that it totally missed him. My Eddie snapped it before he was ready. It goes behind him. He had the wherewithal to pick it up and the corner blitzed knowing that, Hey, ball, he saw the ball. He's going to go after it. And he just calmly throws it to his man. Kiki Chisholm was wide open. I mean, that that's a red shirt freshman making that play on the road. I was really impressed by that. If he can do plays like that, you know, he's going to be able to move the ball and do some good things for this offense at some point. Well, and the LSU defense, like, yeah, they gave up 6 million yards against Mississippi State. Sorry, I didn't see that game because Missouri was playing at the same time, obviously. But uh, but that was about Bo Pelini being stubborn and just, just continuing to do the same thing over and over and over. That wasn't about – LSU got dudes on defense. They, they do every year. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, thanks for all the tweets. Don't forget, we're at Tiger Sidelines. We'll take a break when we come back. We'll talk about an upset on the soccer pitch. You're watching Tiger Sidelines on MC22. Welcome back to Tiger Sidelines, everybody. I'm Bo Bayman. Gabe DeArmond and Dave Matter join me. A big win by the women's soccer team, upsetting number 13 Vanderbilt 2-1 to one to move to 1-1 one one on the season. The Tigers... We'll travel to Tennessee on Friday. It's their first win over a ranked opponent, I believe, in five years. Senior Cassidy Nurnberger was named SEC Defensive Player of the Week, the first Tiger to win Defensive Player of the Week in three seasons. So congratulations to Brian Blitz and the ladies for a big win at home, uh, 2-1 to one over Vanderbilt. Cross Country defended its home course at Gans Creek by taking the individual and the men's team titles. Seniors Kieran Wood and Sarah Chapman Won the individual races. The women's team finished second. And now as we get back to football, our fearless predictions. First off, how about number 22, Texas at Oklahoma, Gabe? A game that features a couple of teams with a lot of losses. Yeah, I'd I'd be fine if – can they both lose? Can I pick that? (laughs) Um, That'd be okay. I – I don't know. I, th- I still think Oklahoma has better players. Um, but they're both kind of train wrecks right now, but Texas has been a train wreck for a long time. Oklahoma's only been a train wreck for like a week and a half. Yeah. Uh, number seven at number one, Clemson 
Dave, the, the Tigers are at home, so you think this is, quote-unquote, their toughest test, but I kind of think that they'll roll on. Yeah, I, this is a, a good game for the ACC so they can maybe, you know, validate itself as not just a one-team league like they've been for a while. But then again, if Clemson loses, then that's not good for the ACC either because maybe you don't – well, maybe Miami is in the playoff mix, but I don't know if they're good enough to go unbeaten. So you got to go with Clemson until somebody knocks them off. They're the kings of that conference. We talked about this one earlier. I'll have both of you talk about Tennessee at Georgia and what you think will happen. Georgia? Yeah, I, I think Georgia's got the best defense in the country. Tennessee's not going to line up and, and run the ball all over them. And Jared Garantano, despite what Missouri fans have seen out of him the last two years, just doesn't look to me like an SEC championship type quarterback. They're a, they're a total line of scrimmage team. I mean, they were trotting out seven offensive linemen in these jumbo packages they were running. They just got Cade Mays back to transfer from Georgia. So they've got to kind of keep it low score and keep it on the ground. And I don't think – I don't think – I think Georgia's just better at doing those things than Tennessee is right now. And then finally, we'll wrap up the show with Missouri and LSU, wherever that game is played. Tigers versus the Tigers. Can Missouri make – or take steps forward in week number three? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't seen much of LSU. I, I don't know exactly what to think, but I, I can see this being – people come out of it feeling a little better than the first couple weeks, but I don't expect it to be a game that at any point you think Missouri really has any chance to win. I mean, I see something probably like 28-10. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking something similar to the Tennessee score. I think, I think LSU can get in the 30s unless that was just a bad day for Missouri's defense and they can come out and play a lot better than that. Um, but I don't think Missouri is going to score much. I just, if they can only get 12 points at Tennessee and assuming this game is on the road, not that it really matters because if it's in Columbia, I don't think you're going to have fans there. You're not going to have many. Um, I, I just, Missouri just can't score other than Harrison Mevis and one touchdown a game. They just can't score with the big boys right now. Yeah, absolutely. Don't forget that game kicks off at 8 o'clock on Saturday on ESPN. All right, that'll do it for this week of Tiger Sidelines. For Gabe DeArmond and Dave Matter and Matt Wacker behind the scenes, want to thank Brian Austin as well. I'm Bo Bayman. You've been watching Tiger Sidelines right here on MC22.